Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to, my talk, to our talk. We're going to be talking about how to get allocators out of our way. Going to jump right into it. Allocators, as you know, are great. Like without allocators, we, we're going to do this very simple little algorithm for counting the number of unique characters in a string. So we start with a set of unique characters. We insert all the characters from the string into the set. Only the unique ones will get inserted, and we return the number of characters. Simple enough? OK. Can we make this any better? Well, there's plenty of ways you can make it better, but within this algorithm, can we make it any faster? Because if this is called in a tight loop with lots and lots of strings, the speed might make a difference. So let's do that. Let's make it faster by making allocation faster. We're going to start by creating a buffer on the stack of characters that's going to make it possible to allocate into this stack. And we're going to use a standard resource, which we'll get into a little bit later, called the monotonic buffer resource that is going to allocate from that buffer. Now, if it runs out of space in that buffer, it's just going to go to the general heap and get another buffer, another block, and allocate from that. And it'll keep doing that. But if it fits within this buffer, it'll never go to the heap at all. So if we do this, we get, we have, well, first of all, we have, to, we have to actually put the allocator into the uh, set. So we have to change from using a, a std set to a std PMR set. And we have to pass the resource as a constructor argument to our set. So now this set uses the monotonic buffer resource that we've created above. And when we do this, we get a 5x speed up with certain data sets. That's pretty great, I think. And it's not a lot of code, right? We didn't add a whole lot of code to do this. But there are costs. And the costs are not generally in using allocators. We just saw that three lines gave us this great speed up. We were actually able to allocate off the stack. You know, if we could use a different resource to get different properties. The major costs are in the infrastructure and middleware that develops the allocator aware classes. If you get it wrong, those are, there are costs to that. So anything that makes it more complicated to use allocators or to, to build your types that use allocators means that you're going to introduce new bugs and there'll be costs to that. And even if you have good allocator aware software already, it isn't perfect. It's incompatible with certain library, certain language features, and we'll, we'll get into that as well. So let's see if we could reduce the cost. In today's talk, we're going to give you a sneak preview of a language proposal that Alistair and I are working on that'll reduce the costs almost to zero for developing a class that uses allocators. And in the process, we hope to make all allocator aware classes a little bit closer to perfect. This is, by the way, Michelangelo's David, which is supposed to be some idealized view of a, of a figure. We're not showing the most perfect parts yet. <laughs> so let's introduce ourselves. My name is Pablo Halpern. I am an independent software consultant. My big client right now is Bloomberg, so I'm working closely with Alistair. I'm a member of the C++ Standards Committee, and I'm sorry to say I'm to blame for a lot of the allocator stuff that is currently in the standard. I'm also to blame for some of the good stuff about allocators that are in the standard. This is my sixth year presenting at CppCon, and this is my nerdy car. If you look closely at the license plate, you'll see why it's nerdy. But the real reason why it's nerdy is because it's a Prius. Alistair? So, I'm Alistair Meredith. This is my fifth year presenting at uh, CppCon. I took the second one off for some reason. Uh, I'm also a member of the C++ Standards Committee. Um, I spent four or five years serving as the library working group chair around about the period of C++14 for my sins, but luckily Marshall took that away from me, so thank you Marshall. <laughs> um, this was my last car, I uh, moved to Manhattan a decade ago and I don't really need one anymore, and certainly not that one. That's a pretty snazzy car, Alistair, but I think people will agree that mine is nerdier. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? Memory is like the oxygen of computing. But unlike the air that we breathe, which is invisible, the allocators that we use to get control over our memory is anything but invisible. They're all over our interfaces, and they're in our implementations, giving us an opportunity to get things wrong. So at this stage, allocators are still 
in our way. I don't know what the timer just did. When allocators were first introduced, they were introduced for a reason other than controlling memory allocation, despite their name. And in fact, they were not very useful. In fact, they're pretty much not useful at all for controlling memory allocation. So we started with basically nothing in C++ 98 and C++ 03. C++ 11, we made some inroads into making allocators useful. We tipped the balance a little bit towards usability by inventing the scoped allocator model and adding the reliability to use state in your allocators because the most useful allocators are the ones that are per object, not for the entire program, not for an entire class. In C++ 17, we made a really important change, which is we added the polymorphic uh, allocator, which allows you to build types without making templates out of everything. This made a lot of things simpler, and in my opinion, sort of tipped the balance towards usability, but just a little. We still have a lot of stuff on the other side of the balance. Our goal is to put everything on the good side of the balance. All of the good stuff that you get from allocators without all of the costs. We don't have that yet. A little outline of our talk. We're going to start talk by talking about why we need allocators in the first place, how they've improved over the years, why they are still in our way or how they are still in our way, and the language changes that we might make to get them out of our way. At the end of this talk, what I hope you'll understand is the good and the bad of allocators today, uh, but we want you to get really excited about our proposal. We do need feedback. The proposal is in very early stages, and we want your undying devotion to this cause. So let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about performance, and specifically memory performance. Memory is arranged in in a hierarchy you've, where you've got the memory closest to the CPU in caches, L1, L2, and L3. Then you have your main memory. And then you have the stuff that didn't fit in memory, main memory that is put out, paged out to disk. Each layer is at least an order of magnitude faster than the layer further down the chain. Now, because of that, you want to keep things that are used together together in memory so that they occupy, for example, the same cache line or at least the same page in virtual memory so that when they're used together, you don't constantly go back to main memory when you should, should still be in cache or go all the way out to disk when you should be at least in main memory. Diffusion is the property of your objects being scattered throughout main memory so that that property doesn't hold and that hurts the performance, especially of long running programs. So why do we need custom memory allocation? Well, we want to improve performance. From the slide before, there we want to have get all these good qualities that make programs fast. We want to be able to place objects in special kinds of memory, for example, persistent memory. And we want to instrument our, 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 the use of a specific object's use of memory, for example, to see if it's leaking memory, if it's using memory efficiently, like doing too many allocations, deallocations, that kind of thing. It's great for testing, for example, or performance measurements. But mostly, what we care about is performance. So with custom memory allocation, we can make sure that things get allocated, for example, in contiguous pages. Because if you're allocating from a specific allocator, the allocator will try and fill up a page before it goes on to the next one, and so on. We can avoid concurrency locks in a lot of situations. And I'll get into a little bit, little bit of detail later. But mainly, the, when, when you use a specific object, it's very often used it does all of its allocation and all of its deallocation in one thread. So why are you paying the cost of concurrency locks for something that is basically single-threaded? We can reduce fragmentation, which is different from diffusion. Fragmentation is the, is, is the free space getting chopped up so that you can't find a big block of memory when you need one. But fragmentation makes diffusion worse as well. And we can place objects in special memory, places like high bandwidth memory or persistent memory, or like I said, uh, you know, we can gather statistics on allocations and deallocations and other things. So I'm going to start talking about allocators now, but I'm going to give you this warning. Consider this a trigger warning. Uh, we're going to go into C++ 11 land, and it's a little bit like opening the gates of hell. Uh, but I promise you that I will get you through this, and we will emerge into a, a nicer universe. 
But first, let's talk about C++11 allocators. A C++11 allocator, like any allocator, is an encapsulation of something that allocates and deallocates memory. So its main functions are allocate and deallocate. No surprise there. We take these allocators and we plug them in to, for example, our containers. So here we have a vector that is being parameterized by a specific type of allocator, and then we pass an allocator object as a constructor argument to our vector. So it's a plug-in system. We don't have a different vector for every different kind of memory allocation strategy. Instead, we, we parameterize it and uh, instantiate uh, or instance it when, with the constructor with specific allocators. So a big, a big leap forward from having to do everything with a custom memory allocation where you have to uh, decide when you're writing your data structure what kind of memory allocation you need, that would just be prohibitively costly to do that. Notice that we still have our hell flames in the background here because we're not done yet. Okay, but since C++11, we have had the support for stateful allocators, which means that each object could have a different instance of an allocator, even if they're using the same type of allocator. But the allocators are complicated. There's a lot of type defs, a lot of propagation traits, which are other kinds of type defs. Uh, I'm not even going to get into what those, all those things do. Uh, we've got the rebind thing. So that those of you who remember rebind, this is where everybody got it wrong because they inherited from std allocator, which gave you the wrong rebind, and you would end up getting std allocator when you actually meant something else. Um, member functions uh, and, and the non-member operators. But we have in C++11, so we're still, even though we're still in hell, things are sort of looking up. We have allocator traits, which is this uniform interface between a container and the allocator, and it provides useful defaults for almost all of these things. So normally all you really care about are the value type, allocate, deallocate, and the comparison operators. Now for the container writer, as Michael knows, it's a different story. Allocator traits are actually make things a lot harder. But for the user of the allocator, or the person writing an allocator, it makes life a lot easier. I'll disagree a little bit. Allocator traits actually do make things a lot simpler for the, for the container author because they take away the generality of all the allocator concerns you might have to think about. But they do make you address them. And that's why you're finally perceiving the complexity that was always there. That's, that's a really good point. Yes. Yeah. But, but never underestimate people's ability to shoot the messenger. All right, so what about nested containers? If we have something like a vector of string, the vector can be created with an allocator, but then every string you insert into it could theoretically have its own allocator, could be a different allocator. So this um, should give you pause for like, is this, how useful is this really? You don't have the physical coherency of saying, well, I want to allocate all from these specific pages or something like that. Whatever your allocator is doing that is good, it only does it good for the little beanstalk in the middle of your vector, all the strings do their own thing. And there's a lifetime issue because every allocator is managing some resource. If the resource doesn't outlive the vector, you're in trouble, right? If you've inserted a string that uses a certain resource and then that resource goes out of scope, you have basically met the, the dangling pointer problem. So we address this. We're still in C++11, but this slide doesn't have a lot of fire and brimstone behind it, because this is one of the good things we did in C++11, which is a scoped allocator model. In the scoped allocator model, the allocator passes itself into the object that it constructs, so that when you create a vector of string using a scoped allocator, the vector uses the allocator, and then every string that you insert into it gets copied into using that same allocator. As the diagram shows, the vector, or our container here, allocates memory from that allocator, the allocator is called my allocator, because <clears throat> it was passed as the constructor here. And then all of the strings inside the container use the same allocator for their memory. So this is a lot cleaner. You get all the benefit that you were trying to get from the allocator in the first place, and you have only one allocator whose lifetime you have to manage and, and be aware of. If I understand correctly, this is the key to solving the memory diffusion problem. Yes, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Because as, the, as this uh, irregular shape shows, all of these things are allocated close together theoretically. The scoped allocator adapter is what makes this work with any allocator. You, you can adapt it 
to use the scope model. Ah, but we aren't out of the fire yet, because although I wrote vector of string, it's not really a vector of string here. You have to somehow instantiate the allocators in here, and the allocators have pretty ugly names because it's a scoped allocator adapter around some other kind of adapter that is instantiated on the element type and, and so on and so on. Please don't try and read this here. <laughs> One of the consequences of the fact that we had to instantiate this thing way beyond the length of the actual name, because you can certainly simplify that with type defs and so on, is that the allocator type is part of the type of the container so that something like this won't work. We, we have a function declaration. This works by itself, the function declaration that takes a std vector uh, as an argument. And now we create a std vector on the stack, uh, but this std vector uses an allocator that we, that we wanted to use called myalloc. That's the type of the allocator, and the, and the object of that allocator is called some alloc. Okay, great. So now we are creating a vector that uses a specific type of allocator. And then we try and pass that vector into our function and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because there, we have two types, two different incompatible types. This vector type is instantiated with myalloc, whereas std vector by default is, is instantiated with std allocator. Two different allocator types means two different vector types. Two different vector types mean you can't pass one vector by reference as the other. This is a problem. Now this works. If we, make it, if we make our function into a template, this works in that you can uh, now uh, templatize on the allocator type itself, and now you can call this function with a vector of any, with using any kind of allocator. But it doesn't scale. If this function is, uh, you know, calls another function that calls another function, and you've got 10,000 lines of code behind this one little interface, you don't want to make all of that into templates. Your compile times are bad to begin with, and your modularity, your ability to manage your source base is, is, is compromised. So works, but it doesn't scale too well. So the allocator template policies are part of the problem that we've created. They've existed from, the, from before C++11, but C++11 made them worse only because it made allocators useful. It, this problem didn't actually get worse. It's just that allocators weren't useful enough before for you to even notice it. Okay, so congratulations. We got through the, the fire under brimstone and you've come out to the, this peaceful surrounding. So we're gonna now show how we get ourselves out of this problem that we got into. Because we're not, we still made a lot of improvements in C++ 17, um, even though we didn't get to our end goal yet. We have in C++ 17, the PMR, uh, which is, stands for Polymorphic Memory Resource, uh, system, which is that memory resource is a non-template cl class that allocates and deallocates memory. And then we have a wrapper called polymorphic allocator that wraps a pointer from a memory resource and gives it all of the qualities of a C++11 allocator, so it meets the allocator requirements. And then each container has an alias in the PR, PMR namespace, so that if you say std PMR vector, what you get is a vector instantiated with a polymorphic allocator, allocator type. So you don't have to type that all out. And this is like our standard vocabulary type for vector now. So let's talk a little bit about the details of, of a polymorphic memory resource. Polymorphic memory resource is a class. It has virtual allocate, no, it has allocate and deallocate functions that delegate to virtual functions called do allocate and to do deallocate. And that's just because the way the standard likes to do things. Um, and they do the obvious thing that they actually let you specify the alignment um, in addition to the size, and they, they, they trade in bytes. They don't work with objects. They work with just raw memory, like malloc and free. Just to complete the picture, we also have a destructor, obviously, and this is equal, which also delegates to a virtual function and does the obvious thing, compares for equality. Polymorphic allocator is a wrapper around a pointer to a memory resource. It has a cons default constructor that uses a default memory resource. And this is actually a function in the standard get default resource that returns the default for the entire program of the memory resource if you don't specify a different one. If you do specify a memory resource, 
you get that memory, memory resource. And notice that this is not an explicit constructor. So this is a conversion constructor. You can pass the memory resource pointer directly into any function that expects a polymorphic allocator. That's very much by design. If you want to get the resource back out to look at it, the resource function does that. The allocate function simply delegates to the resource, and the deallocate function does the same, delegates to the resource. Clear? So why is this so cool? Well, the resource type is, the, is, is determined at runtime, which means that if you have a specific module compiled, uh, it doesn't need to know the, the, res the uh, memory resource or the allocator being used. So you get the interoperability problems go away. Our example on the left is the one that didn't work that I showed a few slides ago because of the incompatibility between std vector and std vector using myalloc. The one on the right does work because we've changed the type of vector to be a PMR vector, which is our new vocabulary for a vector of int or a vector of anything, the PMR vector. We create a PMR vector here and we can pass an allocator in there. So then when we call our function, these two vector types are the same and this works just fine. So we've written func once, we've instantiated once because it's not even a template, um, and we can call it from many different places using many different allocators. Polymorphic allocator byte is a little bit special in C20. We kind of called it now the one true allocator vocabulary type. When in doubt, use polymorphic allocator byte. In C20, we've abbreviated it and made byte optional, so you can just use the, the little diamond here uh, to, to name it. It doesn't produce the type of uh, viral template explosion that using normal allocator does that where you have to instantiate it on a type. You just pass one of these things around, and it uses the scope allocator model. A polymorphic allocator, all of the polymorphic allocator, use the scope model, so they pass themselves down to member objects. I understand correctly, the whole reason that we're going down to a single vocabulary type now is the only reason polymorphic allocator is a template is because the allocator traits that we put in for backwards compatibility with C++11 require it to be a template just to do the rebind. Yes, that's exactly right. If you are writing new code using allocators, you don't have to use any of the template stuff. You just use polymorphic allocator byte. It's, it, polymorphic allocator is a template only to be compatible with C++11 vectors and things like that. So now that we have a nice little infrastructure, we need to actually create some, something that allocates memory. Fortunately, there's an app for that, as I like to say. C++17 provides standard memory resources. So unless you need to do something very special, you may not have to write a memory resource at all. The new delete resource is the one you get if you don't specify anything else. It returns uh, a resource, it just delegates to operator new and operator delete. So it uses the global heap. It's always available, it's general purpose, it's thread safe, and like I said, it's just what you get when you don't want to specify anything else. So you can ignore all, all of this stuff if you don't need the performance or any of the other benefits that you get from allocators. Simply ignore it because you'll just get new and delete, which is what you've always been getting all along. If you do want to start specifying something interesting, the unsynchronized pool resource is maybe the next thing to look at. It's very general purpose for uh, containers that grow and shrink or whatever, um, allocate and deallocate. Um, it, they, it, it works efficiently by pooling similar sized objects into contiguous chunks. So uh, especially if you have like a node-based container like a list and all of the nodes are the same size, they will all get put right next to each other. There'll be no fragmentation. They'll be very close together and give you all that locality. Very nice that way. Um, it is single threaded, which may sound like a downside, but in fact, it's first of all performance upside because it doesn't do locking and unlocking. Um, and uh, it's appropriate only for non-concurrent containers, but guess what? Chances are you've never used a container that isn't, that is concurrent, unless maybe you're Michael who uses, you know, a lot of concurrency. Although no, even in, even in that kind of stuff that you didn't thrust, you would not current. current. So vector, st uh, string, map, unordered map, set, unordered set, all of those containers are not thread safe. That is to say you cannot, they're, they're thread safe in the, in, the, in the most basic sense in that 
you can operate on two different vectors in different threads and they're not going to interfere. But you cannot operate on one vector in two different threads without expecting to get race conditions. All right, so no, there's not real downside there. Um, it can't be used simultaneously by containers in different threads. So if you create two vectors using the same resource, they'd better be used in the same thread. And uh, that's a very common situation anyway, or sometimes the allocator is created for just one container anyway. But the, ba the basic advantage of it being single-threaded is it avoids concurrently lock overhead. Now, I'll just mention that there is a synchronized version of this that is thread safe and is really inefficient in every implementation I've seen. So I don't really recommend it because the, using something like TC malloc or something like that would probably be better. <laughs> Finally, we get more specialized still with the monotonic buffer resource. This is great for containers that you just kind of build up, you build up, you build up, you use them for a while, and you need to tear it all down. You don't keep adding and del deleting elements and so on. Because it's good for that for a couple of reasons. One is that the allocate function is ultra fast. It just kind of advances a pointer through a buffer for the most part. Occasionally, you have to allocate another buffer. And the deallocate function is a no-op. So your destructors run really fast. Uh, of course, you wouldn't want to use it for something where you're constantly doing a lot of insertion and deletion, but there's a lot of containers where you don't do that. So here's an example. And here we're going to actually allocate from stack memory. And this example is very similar to the one I showed at the beginning of the presentation. We create a stack, a buffer on the stack, and we create a monotonic buffer resource using that buffer. And then we create a list that uses that resource. Notice I'm passing the, the, the address of the resource into that constructor, and it's automatically converted into a polymorphic allocator because that is what, the, what, what list is using. And then we do something that inserts a bunch of elements into the list, and then we do something that processes all the elements in the list, and then at the closed curly brace, the destructors run, which like I said, run very fast because the deallocation is a no-op, and then all the memory from the monotonic resource is returned wherever it came from. Now, if you did not exceed your buffer, that means nothing happens, right? But if you did exceed your buffer, it will have gone to the heap and gotten a bigger buffer and continued allocating from there. And all of that gets returned at the destructor of the resource. Good? I'm gonna mention the test resource. The test resource is for testing and debugging. It, it collects uh, statistics, it can catch a bunch of uh, allocator misuse. For example, if you deallocate something more than once, if your allocations and deallocations don't match, you can get memory leaks and so on. And it provides a, the ability to do some exception testing of your type. So this is a great class to use in test drivers. It's not, it's not only in test drivers, but it is one really important use of the test allocator. Only downside is it's not in the standards yet. Uh, we're, we're working on it. There's a proposal for it. And there's an open source implementation that you can use today at this URL, which also shows up at the end of the slides. So when the slides get distributed at the end of this conference, uh, you can get it. Um, and I definitely recommend, if you're interested in the test allocator, to go to Attila's talk tomorrow at 4.45, which is exactly about this test allocator. Another thing to mention about these resources in the standard is that they can be chained. That is to say, you can you specify an upstream resource for each uh, resource when you construct it, saying, when you run out of the memory in your pool, where are you going to get the memory from? So I'm going to create a little bit of a hokey example here, but we'll have a monotonic buffer resource, and then we'll create a pool, an unsynchronized pool resource on top of it, which means that when the unsynchronized pool resource needs to chunk, allocate another chunk of memory for another pool, it'll get it from the monotonic buffer resource. And we'll create a test resource on top of the pool resource. So the final chain looks something like this. You notice at the bottom of the chain, at the end of the chain, is the new delete resource, because that's what you get when you don't specify any other upstream resource, just as, as you would expect. All right, so now we have allocators. How do we actually use them? Or how do we actually build types that use them? Let's start with a really simple class that uses allocators. We have a class here that has two strings, and a vector, and it has to have a constructor. In this case, we'll have a constructor that takes two arguments, the name and the, and the email, and constructs things in the obvious fashion. I don't think people need this to be explained too, too deeply, right? Now we want this to be allocator aware. We want this to work with 
with our polymorphic memory resources. So we, instead of using string, we use PMR string. Now, just for brevity, I've left out the STD colon colon at the beginning of all the standard types, but it would be st STD colon colon PMR colon colon <laughs> string. So we've changed now to use PMR strings and vectors so that we can play in, the, in this nice new world of polymorphic allocators. We add our allocator type here so that we can advertise to the world that we use an allocator. And we're using our little convenient diamond here. And we, add a re we, we modify our constructor so that it takes an allocator as an optional argument at the end. So you can still construct this thing without specifying an allocator and you'll get the default allocator, which is the new and delete allocator. But if you do specify an allocator, we need to make sure that we pass that allocator down to each of the strings and the vector in the constructor. So it's a fairly straightforward process. Just pass the allocator down to all of your members, all of your base classes, and you're good. There are some complications. I just want to call out a quick clarification there, just because it is a subtle detail that's easily missed. The using allocator type, it looks like a convenience, but that's also the trigger in allocator traits that means this type will now support the scoped allocator model. That's right. So that's an easy mistake to accidentally make. That's why I'm calling it out. Yeah, thank you. If, you, if we didn't have it there, then if you inserted this type into a vector, the allocator wouldn't get passed down into it. So you do need to specify that, that using declaration. Thank you, Alistair. The complications are that there are some interactions with the allocator argument and the other arguments in your, uh, in your constructors. So if you already have default arguments in your constructor, you want all of the prefixes to be valid. So in this constructor here, before we add the allocators, we have the name, which is always present, an optional email, and an optional grades vector. Okay, so you want to be able to specify the name alone, or the name and email, or the name, email, and grades. Once we add allocators to the mix, you still want to be able to specify those three permutations, each of them you want with and without an allocator. So you have to, you, you can't just put a default allocator argument at the end because then you would not have all of those permutations. You would, you'd have the only one permutation that has allocators and that would be specifying all three arguments. So instead you have to overload for each of the defaulted combinations uh, and, and that's what we have here. Another complication is that if you have a variadic template argument list, for those of you who do that kind of thing, um, variadic argument lists always have to come at the end, which means we can't put the default argument for an allocator at the end. So instead, what we have to do is we have to put it at the beginning. And if we have to put it at the beginning, we have to sort of somehow signal that the thing that is at the beginning of this argument list is an allocator, uh, not something else. And that's what we did here. So we now created, went from here to two overloads, one with the allocator down here and one without. Now the way you signal that, the, that you're passing an allocator at the beginning of the argument list is you pass this standard type allocator argt as an argument uh, before the allocator itself. Allocator argt, there is a global variable or, or constant actually uh, called allocator arg, std colon colon allocator arg, and that is when you actually call this constructor, you would pass std colon colon allocator arg as your first argument. That's a little bit of a subtlety that if you forget it in the next 10 seconds, this talk will still be great. Let's go, let's take that and go for a larger example. So we're going to go for something kind of real, something realistic, which is if we were building something like unordered map. In fact, let's exactly build unordered map but we're gonna build it using PMR allocators instead of using template allocators. And we've changed the name to protect the innocent and also to make our slides a little smaller. So we're gonna call it hash map. So hash map looks just like std unordered map, except that it doesn't take an allocator template policy at the end of its uh, parameter list for, for template arguments. That's because it always uses a polymorphic allocator. It does have to specify the allocator type as we talked about before. And they don't need this, this alias here. The only reason it's there is to make our slide smaller so we can use the shorter name. Let's look at the constructors. This is what you sort of expect, would expect. You'd have constructors with and without allocators. These two, you cannot use the default allocator argument uh, trick because of some subtleties with explicit that would take an entire talk to get into. But let's just say that, that 
since, since we introduced uniform initialization, you have to be very careful about using explicit. So we have, <clears throat> we have uh, our, our default constructor with and without an allocator, our copy constructor with and that without an allocator, our move constructor with and that without an allocator, and then we have a bunch of constructors that have default allocators. Oh, but we're not done yet. We have more constructors here. Okay, I think you see where I'm getting at. Now, this is the complete list. And it's all kind of, uh, it's boilerplate. Like you just, it's a lot of cut and paste and you just do the same thing over and over again. There's no, there's no, you know, once you've done it once, it, there's no magic to it. It doesn't require a lot of thinking, but it certainly is an opportunity to make a few mistakes. So even though we've come a long way, we still have a bit of a problem. We still have allocators kind of all over the place. Uh, we have made a bunch of improvements. So I want to just recap that. All right, in C++11, we've improved things like we've simplified the design of allocators with this allocator traits, and we've, we, we're now supporting nested containers. In C++17, we introduced the polymorphic allocator, and we introduced some actual allocators. And most of the reason why we didn't do this in C++11 was because we ran out of time, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> but we still have significant costs that we have to bear. And the, and the cost, as I said, is not just in the interface bloat, but in actually implementing the stuff and making mistakes. If you, if you forget to pass an allocator down to one of your data members, you'll have code that will appear to work until it goes out in the field and either runs out of memory, if you're lucky, or does something even worse if you have a dangling pointer to an allocator that went out of scope or something like that because you didn't pass the allocator down. So the allocators are still in our way. Now, what do we do? We seem to have reached the limit of what we can do with a library. After all, a library cannot reduce your constructors. So maybe we need to start thinking about a language solution. Fortunately, Alistair here has been thinking about a language solution for quite some time. Alistair? So I think this is where I come in. So how can we unlock the potential that we've already explained in allocators with perhaps just a few little tweaks to language. Well, I'm going to start with a simple assumption that Pablo, with all this work getting through to C++17, has largely solved the main problems we need to solve with allocators. We now have a non-template vocabulary that have taken allocators out of the type system when we start using the polymorphic memory resource scheme. The scoped allocator model guarantees all the coherency and everything we want for keeping memory in the containers automatically managed without any further input on the part of the user. And finally, we have a catalog of predefined memory resources that actually unlock the power of the model so we can use it out from the get-go. The main problem is actually providing these facilities through our interfaces is still too hard. As a user of code that's using the system, it's fabulously simple to use. The problem is, it's an awful lot of expense for people to provide you with this easy to use interface. So my goal here is what can we do to eliminate that cost and make this truly simple to use? So we're not going to add anything new to the allocator model. All we're trying to do is unlock the complexity of expressing the model we have today as of C++17. So this would be my ideal solution if I were writing HashMap. I would really like it to be this simple when I'm writing all those constructors. So my goal is to see how close can I get to this? I'm not going to promise this, but this is the goal that I'm trying to get towards. So we'll start with a simple assumption. So I'll go back a slide because it's a little too fast. The one thing you'll notice is I do not have any allocators in this interface. So how am I going to actually supply allocators to this code if there's now no allocator in the interface? Well, I'm going to invent figment of my imagination, something called an allocator aware type. And one of the things that an allocator aware type can do is it can be supplied an allocator out of band from the regular constructor arguments. So here's a syntax we're suggesting that might allow us to say, in addition to your regular constructors, I'm going to supply an additional argument, which is the, hit the right button on the, there we go, with a using, to say, in addition to the regular arguments I'm supplying to the constructor, you have this additional argument. And it's kind of as if all those constructors have a hidden, invisible, additional argument. 
if I'm using copy initialization, the using drops next to the thing that I'm trying to supply the allocator to. Then we have equals and all the things that I'm calling it with. So the syntax jumps around a little bit, it mostly just works. Final example, I'm trying to create with a temporary. Well, this is going to use either copy, uh, copy elision or the move constructor, in which case, in both cases, I'm going to want to get the allocator from the object I'm initializing with. This is the move constructor, is that one special case? So we put the using over here, not on the C. And mostly I believe this as a syntax will just solve the problem. And luckily the using keyword is sitting out there happily waiting for us to overload it as the standard committee loves to do. So what are the essential properties of this mythical allocator aware type I'm talking about? Well, the first thing is obvious. You can initialize these things with this extra using clause. And if I don't supply a using, I just get the default allocator. So if I don't use it, don't care about allocators, I say nothing about allocators, I get the system default, which is good enough. In addition, I'm just going to assume built in that these funky allocator aware types apply the scoped allocator model because we know that is the right model for dealing with code at scale to avoid diffusion and all those other problems. One of the key things we've got to do is we've got to be able to advertise our allocator. Because imagine I'm now in the position that I want to do some work, build up an object, and then insert it into an existing container. Well, I want that to efficiently move, but it's not going to move unless it's using the same allocator as that container. And if this container's passed to me as a function argument, I don't know what its allocator was, because I might not be the one who's applied it. So I need to be able to retrieve the allocator from the container, and then I can use that allocator to build my object. So a universal property of any allocator aware type is I need to be able to retrieve its allocator. And finally, we're going to create a type trait for these things because in general C++, if you have some interesting property, somebody at some point in generic code is going to have some reason to dispatch and do things differently. So preemptively, we just assume we're going to need that trait. But we've still got this fundamental question of when is a class allocator aware? Well, I'm going to start with a simpler question. When does the class need to be allocator aware? It needs to be allocator aware if it has any allocator aware base classes or any allocator aware data members, because I need to propagate the allocator into those bases and members. And at this point, I start thinking, well, this sounds a little bit like virtual functions. A class is polymorphic and acquires a V table if it has any virtual functions or if we add any virtual functions. So I'm proposing that is my definition of what makes a class allocator aware. No extra markup, no extra syntax. It is simply implicitly allocator aware if it has any allocator aware base classes or any allocator aware members. And already I'm sure that the studio you are saying, but how do I make that a principal basic type, the original allocator aware type? Well, I'm afraid it's a kind of magic. At some point we need to inject allocator awareness into the system so that we can then have bases and members that have picked up this allocator aware property. Uh, tentatively, these are all placeholder names. There's nothing concrete about our proposal to that extent yet. Um, PMR2 does simply be put into a different namespace so we're not colliding with the existing facilities. Um, polymorphic allocator is a template so it works with all the existing containers. That might turn out not to be important. How will we implement the magic? Well, if we're specifying a language feature, we can certainly specify compiler magic. But if you've been attending talks here the last few years, Herb spoke about meta classes that he's keen on a couple of years ago. There's an awful lot of proposals around now about reflection. It turns out we might be able to build all of this facility using all of the other facilities that are coming in. But ultimately, at the root of it, I think we're going to need a little bit of, just a little bit of compiler magic to get that original taint into the type to say it's allocator aware. So, now I'm going to finally implement that hash map we saw with those constructors. And the only change I need to make is I now have a PMR2 polymorphic allocator. And because PMR2 polymorphic allocator is allocator aware, my whole class now is allocator aware. And it just works with the new using syntax every time I want to pass an allocator. Done. So the, so the language now will automatically add the ability to accept an allocator for every one of these constructors without having to specify it. 
because that's signature. the whole essential property of allocator aware. That's the problem we're trying to solve to take the syntax out of the problem. Okay. In result, I now have fewer and simpler constructors. I've gone through 15 constructors in the example Pablo presented, down to five in my form. I get there because we don't have to have all those different overloads for explicitness now just to cope with the allocator being explicit. Um, the copy and the move constructor can now just be the plain simple copy and move constructors. Um, the default argument lists just work the way they do because I don't have to have a funky allocator after every possible combination. And yes, we have one fewer argument to pass because it's going through silently. The big bonus is now there's no chance for me to screw up how I hooked all those things together because the compiler is going to do that and I'm going to trust my compiler is implemented correctly so this code will just work. So we have extra maintenance because, extra maintenance solutions because we now no longer have to write all that code and we can't make these things accidentally um, incompatible with different allocators. So let's have another example. We're going to go with a build up a well-known idiom here. Some of you might already look ahead and guess. So I'm going to build a simple class object. It's got a string data member using the existing C++17 PMR allocators. I advertise in the traditional way that I'm going to be a C++17 allocator aware type. I provide the default constructor with um, a defaulted allocator. I'm going to allow this one being explicit because I was running out of space on the slide. I'm going to provide the copy constructor. Uh, because Pablo copied from the standard, he couldn't quite use this little neat trick, but if I want to have an allocator-aware copy constructor, I can simply default the allocator like I could for most of the other cases. However, the move constructor is different because if I don't specify an allocator when I'm moving, I really want to take the allocator from the object I'm moving from to guarantee that is efficient. On the other hand, if I supply the default allocator, that says I'm going to move and use the default allocator to allocate the new object, so I might have to make copies of those things I was moving from. So for the default, for the move constructor, you always have to split it into two in, whoops, in this fashion. Um, finally, rule of six, I'm now going to have to, I'm just going to default the destructor and the two um, assignment operators. So this is the problem that Pablo was talking about, that there's simply too much code in our interface. How can I clean this up using the new allocator aware types? Well, first of all, I'm going to have a PMR2 string, and I no longer need to have this type def. That's gone away. It's automatically provided now by the... the we'll, we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> Offline. <Okay. laughs> Some parts of the sub design still subject to design. So looking at the other constructors, well, the copy and move constructors, I can now simply default. I don't need this funky extra argument for the, for the move constructor. So I'm now just left with the default constructor so I can supply a value to the name. And that's our rule of five in play. But can we do any better? Well, those of you who know C++11 know we have these data member default member initializers. Now, the problem with default member initializers with C++17 allocators is whenever I initialize my string, I need to call the constructor to pass it an allocator. So even in the case of the default constructor, I'm going to have to put the, string, the value there in order to also pass the allocator. So if my class is implemented correctly, any default member initializers will be ignored for allocator aware types because every allocator aware type will explicitly have an initializer in all the constructors. Whereas, with the new model, the allocator being supplied implicitly through the system, I can now just go back to the regular default, which means whoop, rule of zero. Very good. And this type is fully allocator aware, has all the good properties of the existing C++17 allocator aware code you can use today. It's just provided by the compiler. Now, if we're talking about types that have no constructors, we get into the world of aggregates. Now, just to be sure we're on the same page, aggregates are an awkward corner of the C++ type system, largely inherited from C, that if a type has no constructors, it doesn't use constructors to perform initialization. There's a few additional rules, such as you know, all your members are public, you have no funky base classes, but 
it's a common thing that I'm going to have a type that simply is a declaration of data, and now I have an aggregate. I have no constructors. I cannot synthesize my funky special allocator aware constructors that are going to pass an allocator as an extra argument because I don't have those constructors. And this is why I can solve that problem with the C17 allocator model. Because as soon as I provide constructors to pass the allocator, I'm no longer an aggregate and I've lost this simple model. So the way aggregate initialization works in C is I have my, whoops, I keep using the wrong button on the remote here. I got my three arguments coming through in the brace list. They simply get mapped directly to initializing each member in turn. This isn't construction. This is separate initialization of each of the three members by the compiler. And similarly in C20, we can actually have designated member initializers and name just the members we want to initialize, and the others get default constructed. Bonus slide for C20. Mm -hmm. So, how does an allocator aware aggregate work? Well, First of all, I'm going to use allocator aware data members. So my type is allocator aware. And now I'll simply put my using alloc when I initialize it in the usual way. And now the compiler rules are, as I pass these member initial these initializers through to initialize each member of the aggregate, it applies the using rule. And the other interesting thing to note is I'm not adding any new data members. To the, allocate, to the aggregate, or the student in this case. In order to implement the get allocator method, the compiler knows that it looked at these things. It knows it's allocator aware because it has allocator aware members. So its implicit implementation of the get allocator method is just going to delegate to any one of those members. And it will find the right answer. We do not need to have our own extra redundant copy of the allocator. So there's no space overhead. All the computation of where to delegate to is compile time, so there's no runtime overhead. It just works. Finally, standard arrays, native arrays, are also aggregates oh, yay. and get to follow <laughs> the same rule. And there's no way I can add members and alloc constructors to a regular native array. But following the rules we have for aggregates, they just work. So I'm going to quickly zoom over the idea of language integration. You can see there's a wide variety of things. Whoops, I always try and point to the wrong slide thing. That have a really hard time getting native support out of the current C17 allocator model, which is why I believe it's truly worth delving into a language extension to make sure we actually can inject allocators conveniently and easily into all of those places. Now, the quick obvious question is, but does this have any backwards compatibility concerns? If I'm proposing a new language feature, if I'm going to break ABI and make everybody all the world over rebuild all their code just to work with what I've got, doesn't matter how valuable I claim allocators is, doesn't matter how valuable John claims allocators is, the world is not going to rebuild itself just to support our new toy. So I've got existing code built with existing types. Well, there's no change because that code will still compile, run, link. It will look exactly the same because it's not using the feature. We've not injected allocator awareness into any of those classes. We've not injected any of these properties. It just works. It's the same ABI, so there's no breakage. Now I've got my new allocator aware type. Clearly, that's following the new rules, and we'll have a new ABI. But that can't break old code. Because by definition, I can't write it unless I have a new compiler supporting that new code. And those new features are off into whatever new extended ABI we need for this facility. But that does not interact with the, it inject itself into the old ABI. Now, the truly observant above you, well, among you will have spotted standard array on the previous slide. What happens if I instantiate an existing template with a new allocator aware type? Well, in such cases, an allocator aware data member, if it captures that, is going to start producing new allocator aware types. And those new template instantiations will follow the new ABI rules. But I can only get into the situation if I'm writing new code using a new allocator aware type. And otherwise, everything else should just work. So we're not expecting breakage there. If, if we've done our job right and the source compatibility, there should be no ABI compatibility concerns. But it does bring up. The one concern I do have, the way we achieve this compatibility is we do not invade the existing standard library. 
So if I want new allocator aware types that use my new allocator aware system, it's one final iteration of new vocabulary types just to make it all work. But if we can buy that, the whole system just hangs together and we should be good to go. So, quick summary of how we got here. Um, we were concerned about interface bloat, the implementation complexity of having to hook everything up when you're implementing these containers, and just opportunities for programmer error. We've removed that by simply removing the need to write that code. The compiler has automated all the work we're doing here. We get compatibility with all the other language features. We have ubiquitous access now to allocator awareness in code that might not be, be written obliviously to it, because I can just start using allocators whenever I want to in user code, as long as allocator aware types are used in the original plumbing and they're invisible to the system. We've greatly simplified the interfaces, and the code's more reliable because the compiler is generating all the code for us. In particular, we're not giving up any space efficiencies or performance runtimes because this is exactly the same C++17 allocator model we're already using today. All we've done is automate how you write the same code. I'll let you take over, Pablo. Okay. So a big question, I'm gonna kind of run through this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, the, the question comes up whether some of these concepts could be used for features other than allocators. Right now we are focusing on allocators because that is what we know and we know the parameters of what we need to solve. But it is quite possible that we would wanna use the same kind of ideas for other features. Executors in particular are a lot like allocators. They they encapsulate the the uh, allocation of, of compute resources instead of memory resources, but otherwise have very similar properties to allocators. So we might want to use them for that and a number of other things. We are currently working on a proposal for putting this into a standard. We are still some months out, maybe, maybe about a year before we actually have something that we want to share publicly and share with the standards committee. At the same time, we're working on a prototype compiler, and that compiler would be in lockstep with the proposal so that as we discover things in the implementation, we can adjust the proposal, which is always a good idea. Now, we're actually running short on time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip questions now, and we'll come back to questions after we summarize here. Uh, we know that allocators are, are really good. They provide all these benefits in performance, instrumentation, reliability, uh, and they're easy to use even today, so long as you're the end user and not the person implementing the allocator aware class. The direct language support is, a, is trying to adjust that, that issue. Generate less code by hand, fewer bugs, simpler maintenance, better integration with the rest of the language. Um, and by doing that, we hope that allocator-aware types will be more common, and therefore allocator use will be easier in general because the types you use will all be instrumented for allocators. We have a proposal and a compiler in the works. We're looking for feedback and your undying devotion, as I mentioned before. This is a slide I showed at the beginning of the talk. We're not quite there yet with this. Once we have support in the, in the language, we will have what we're looking for. So I'm going to back up now for questions. <laughs> yeah, just under two minutes. Yes, we have about two minutes. There's a microphone here, please. All right, so I like this. Uh, it sounds like, like I told you, Alistair, when you presented the first, like, early drafts of this, I don't know, was this the year, two years ago here I at CPPCon? Yeah. Uh, this looks very much like Scala's implicits. I think that is both good and bad, uh, so we have to be careful. Um, this, like, I understand that you want to generalize this for other kinds of things, but while generalizing this for other kinds of things, do not forget to generalize this for other kinds of allocators other than just polymorphic allocators, please. This is, consider this an early language evolution feedback. Okay, thank you. Hi, a very interesting talk, appreciate it. Um, Pablo gave an example with a monotonic example with a stack based, uh, it was stack based. And then I think you said if it exceeds a stack, it doesn't, I would assume it would throw, but you said it goes to a heap, is yes. that correct? Yes. And whose responsibility is it then to copy the data to the heap and do the heap allocation? Well, the, 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 the monotonic buffer resource will, once it exhausts its first buffer, it'll go to the new delete resource or whatever 
is its upstream resource and asks for another buffer. And then it manages it the same way it managed it before. At the end, when its destructor gets called, it will release that stuff all back to the heap. So does it go to the default allocator, or can you specify an allocator to fall back? Now you can specify another resource to, okay. for it to fall back on. So you can Great. make your chain as long as you want. Fantastic. Thanks. If you want it to throw, you can even supply the null resource allocator, which just always throws in every allocation. That's intended to serve as the backstop to change where you want that to happen. Okay. So one more question, because we are out of time. Um. Did you consider something like additional function set allocator well, uh, to use uh, in, instead of modifying constructor? Well, the problem with any kind of function that you do use after construction is that you have invariants that you need to uphold, and the allocator has to be passed all the way down through the chain. So you can't construct anything until you've constructed, until you've set the allocator. So I, I don't think that really would work, but interesting idea. Okay, we'll, we'll hang around for a little while longer, but we're out of time, so thank you very much.